unusual for me for a presentation as well, because I don't have a lot of words and spoon-feeding things to read through. Um, it's just pictures and talking uh, about an aspect of uh, wave energy and marine energy that uh, isn't, isn't always in the forefront of our conversation. So first off, let's, let's go through your quiz. We're going to go grade this on the honor system. Um, anybody want to give me some examples of their answers? Let's say, gallon gas thing, how much? 13. Where do you think gas is Oh, it's Alaska, man. We got the pipeline. Uh, six bucks. Yes. Six right. bucks. Gallon of milk. Six bucks. <clears throat> Thirteen. Oh, oh my God. God. It happened out there. <laughs> uh, head of lettuce. I said two fifty, but I'm guessing I'm wrong. Oh, she's Any other guesses? Also thirteen. So this will all start to come to view of why this is in a minute. It all has to do with energy. Uh, Bob Lar. Six. Six. Two fifty. Two fifty. A bunch of bananas. Eight. I don't remember. Yes, you're right. Okay, I had to look my own cheat sheet there. <laughs> you are correct. Eight. Uh, ice cream bar. This is just the one you grab and go. You know. Uh, I don't even know how it's the hobby house, just a flannel bar, a garden variety ice cream bar. Six. Six bucks. Uh, frozen entree. Thirteen. I don't know if be any. Eight. You're right. You're right. How about a case of paper towels? Now, this isn't, well, I shouldn't have brought a written case, but I don't know what they really call it, but it's the bundle. You know, it's a standard, whatever, a dozen paper towels you grab, it's shrink wrapped. How about this will be a test if you know how much it is here. That's your baseline. <laughs> yeah. Some of these aren't even what we pay here. 20. 20? 20? 25. Actually, 20 was 27. Uh, how about the amount that the local school pays to heat and light their building per student per year? Oh, I didn't see the per student. Per student per year. 2,500. Grand? $5,000. Whoa. 145 students, do the math there, their budget is only a few times more than that overall. So it's a huge part of their budget. And it's getting worse. Um, some of you may already know the answer to this, but what does it cost to generate a megawatt hour of electricity in Yakutat, Alaska? So they are paying 57 cents a kilowatt hour right now. So that's between uh, $500 and $600 a megawatt. And I should actually say they're not paying that. That's what the current cost is. The price is less because it's subsidized by the Alaska government. So the Alaska government has an incentive to try and bring this price down too because they're footing a lot of the bill on this. How much are they subsidizing that? Do you know? I, I think they're, it's on the order of 20 to 30 cents, either the final price or they're subsidizing because it all kind of It's 20 to 30 cents basically. Right. Um, so that, I mean, otherwise people just wouldn't be able to afford it even still at those rates. So, uh, yeah, that's just kind of a summary of it. Crazy. Yeah, so it's interesting to look at these. Why is it like this? And you can see it's because a lot of this is due to the energy intensive <laughs> things. So anything that's fresh, uh, lettuce especially, that was an eye, uh, an eye opener for me. Um, something that's fresh and very time sensitive. There's only one way in and out that's quick, and that's air. So Yakutat, and I'll get into this in a minute, but they are not connected to the main mainland for that matter, I mean, they're on the mainland, but their, their highway system is independent and not connected. So the only way you get to that to Yakutat is by plane or by boat. And so if you have something that, you know, maybe it has, you know, can sit around for a while, like things like uh, cold medicine, I always put cold medicine on it because I had to buy some when I was there, and it was about the same as you pay here. It has a long shelf life, it's pretty lightweight, so it's nice to bring it by plane, by barge, it's not to take a lot of space, it's pretty, re pretty reasonable. Um, anything that you have to keep cold, yes, it is Alaska, but you still have to keep it at a certain temperature and a certain condition. So anything you have to keep frozen has that energy surcharge essentially embedded in there because uh, you have to generate that electricity to turn around and cool something down. So where is Yakutat? I don't know how familiar our folks are with Alaska, but I was not that familiar with this. I didn't even know there was this here, to be honest. Um, Alaska comes way down here, and it's this region right in here. Um, Fairly close to Juneau, so just the sea of government. Uh, here's some names you may or may not recognize. 
Uh, the real convenient way that you get there, at least the way I did it, is you fly to here. By the, you, actually, you fly from Seattle, you kind of go, hey, there's Yakutat, yeah, you're flying past. And then you get another plane, and you go down to this one, and then this one, and then it bounces back down to Seattle. Um, so it takes longer, to, it took about as long on the plane to get there as the DC, in terms of leaving the house to arriving at a destination. Um, let's talk a little bit on the history of why on earth anybody even would live there or would live there. Or live there. So, originally, it's uh, like a lot of these uh, communities, it's Native American. Uh, Clinkett, uh, I had to write something down because of Athabascan, Yak. They all sort of populated all around this region and then they gradually migrated and congregated in this central area because it's a lowland plain. Um, very temperate, actually. It's actually a, a subarctic temperate rainforest or something. It's, it's very similar to Oregon, except when it snows a lot. But they don't have tundra, they don't freeze, uh, the ground does not freeze solid like you do get farther north, even into Anchorage. So it's, it's a more of a kind of a cross between Canada and, uh, and uh, Oregon. <coughs> Lots of rainfall. Uh, they get, well, the year before, they were telling us they had, it was a little unusual even for them, they had 24 feet of snow, I think, uh, for the year. And a lot of that happened all at once, so it was pretty uh, crazy. I was asking them how to get to the house, and then, and they were, you know, they were talking about shoveling the roof so that the roof lobe would collapse it, shoveling it up to get it. So there's holes leading down to the roof of your house. It was that that deep. It's crazy. Um, so Yakutat is actually called the Yakutat Borough, which is a sort of a, a, a community. There's a Yakutat town, sort of, but it's really considered the borough. And it's six times the size of Rhode Island, um, which makes it actually, it's, it's also kind of a county, so it's one of the largest counties in the U.S., actually, uh, geographically. Um, that being said, it has a total, grand total of 2010 census, 662 people, so it's pretty sparsely populated. Um, as time went on, uh, it became very attractive in the 1700s, 1800s to, you know, the usual cast of characters, fur traders, prospectors, missionaries. But one of the really interesting things about it is Monte, uh, right in here, so Yakutat, kind of the main part of Yakutat is right down here. This bay really is the only deep water port in the Gulf of Alaska, the, uh, protected, sheltered deep water port, Monte Bay. Um, and it's very, very deep. I don't know if you can see on here, so, this is on the order of almost 100 meters, right up to where the where you can put docks and things. So, it's a very protected. It's kind of the only stop if you're going from, say, the lower 48 up farther north uh, in a steamer or a, in any other ship. Uh, it's really the only main stop to to, to lay over and to protect a sh uh, sheltered shore. Um, so, as time went on, uh, it started to build up as this, you know your regular community. Logging and mills to support mostly the community, the uh, construction of the community. You can see steamers sitting in the deep water port. They don't have to go very far from the shore to get to their depths. Um, another view there. And uh, the railroad sprouted up. Actually, interestingly enough, not so much for logging, but for fish. So they bring fish from the, you know, where the landing to the cannery, and they set up a, a large cannery uh, kind of in Monte Bay. A lot of this action all happens right in here. There's still the train's still there, they can't really get it out. So there's, it doesn't run. It's just it's, they parked it where they parked it, and it became a park kind of thing. Um, but in World War II, this then got the attention of the military because uh, it has a very good strategic location. So that's when the, the military and the CBs and a bunch of other uh, agencies came in and built this massive airport. This is a huge airport, second largest in Alaska, second only to Anchorage. Um, they built all this road infrastructure. They had, it's basically an aviation garrison. So they had uh, the power grid. All of this was really military. And they had ships uh, that they would station there, destroyers and the like. Um, I believe they even launched combat operations out here, at least for the, from the air side. And then it was also, a, uh, there, apparently this is news to me, there's a lot of activity with the Japanese uh, and illusions. And so this was kind of one of the, the close to home base that you could get to uh, when you're having those, those conflicts. So a lot of the a lot of the infrastructure was really World War II era, um, and 
you know, prior to this, as a Native American community, it was subsistence uh, fishing and hunting, uh, and really what's, you know, that, that, that evolved into the, the more larger scale commercial fishing, uh, the, the cannery, resource extraction, but really it was the military that had the biggest footprint of really building it up from a capital infrastructure standpoint. There's still uh, shore defense guns on Cannon Beach, that's why it's called Cannon Beach. There's an amphibious uh, tank uh, parked off Cannon Beach, I'm not really sure how or where they got there. It's a, it's a huge thing, it's very heavy, uh, but it definitely is amphibious at one time. Um, but the biggest asset is, is this airport. airport. Um, right now, Alaska runs actually two daily flights to it. They run combis. I don't know if anybody knows what a combi is. It's a 737. You can see the big door open on it. Half, the front half is cargo, and the second half is like a half of a 737's worth of people. So you're kind of in the back, and the cargo gets to the front, to the first class section. Um, interesting thing, I, I pull up, this is kind of an airman's thing about the airport. You know, you've got to watch out for bears on the runway. And, Snow piles. So when we first landed, there was this three-story tall pile of snow. Now I didn't take this picture. I forgot to take the, the, the picture of the snow pile. It was much taller than this. This was a couple weeks ago in somebody's blog. They find it's like kind of like the rite of spring. Oh, the snow pile is finally being torn down. And but it was huge. It's you can tell it's pretty big there, and it was much bigger even at the time. Um, oh, and there's a common. You can see no windows. That's all cargo and windows. And so these commies service a lot of the, the Cordova, which is a lot smaller airport, a lot scarier to land at, uh, and some of the other communities, Juneau and others, with these combination of cargo and, and uh, people, carriers. So uh, this is another view. This is what's left of the, some of the, the canning industry and some of the, the port infrastructure. It, I get conflicting information if it's really still that big. They claim it's the biggest employer, but also they don't on their website, the, the seafood company doesn't claim they actually do anything here, so I'm not really sure. We didn't get into that too much when we were there. Um, but basically, I think that ties in with a lot of, of I'm not getting into this, and the reasons why the energy is, is critical to get their price of energy down to enable some of these industries. So this is Cannon Beach. Uh, that's actually Rents uh, Lessman from CPT. We were kind of uh, traveling partners on this. Uh, going through the various uh, uh, aspects of this as a wave energy conference, or a renewable energy conference, rather, than we were the wave energy representatives. So, you might ask why wave energy is even, why we're even considering it there. Well, they got good waves. Uh, these are actually pretty small, but you can see there's a surfer there. It turns out this is a world-class surf destination, um, believe it or not. And you got dressed up pretty, pretty warmly, but um, they have big waves. And so it's more and more becoming uh, an attraction in that respect. It's on you know, the top whatever lists of surf destinations for uh, whatever category it is. But um, it was uh, in part because of the cost of energy, in part because of the wave resource, uh, the, the uh, municipality of Yakutat and, uh, and the power company engaged EPRI in 2009 to do a feasibility study, basically, of uh, their, their area for doing wave energy. Now this was interesting because it was, uh, the case study they used was uh, oysters. So uh, this was, and they, they, they did in fact all the financials, all the cost of energy, all that was really around oyster second generation. Uh, and so, um, you know, you can see they were talking about where they would put it in, where they would run the lines to, where the hydro shore side infrastructure would be, and how you tie into the grid. Once you get to the airports, this whole, Diagonal is Cannon Beach, um, but once you get to the airport, there's, that's a pretty good tap into the main town because there's power and, and uh, roads and everything running between the airport and town. So the report, when it's all online, um, it's all online um, and it has a lot of these graphs, but I, I, a lot of the detail, but I just pulled out some of them. I, I guess I promised there wasn't too much scientific stuff, but here's a few things. So if you look at that wave resource, I don't know if folks are familiar with what ours normally looks like, but this is pretty awesome. Um, I think in winter we're in the 30s, is that right? Experts out there, anybody? Yeah, we're right around there. Yeah, yeah, so 30s, and that's, that's our peak. So they're getting almost twice that at their peak. Um, so it's a pretty, it's a pretty wicked environment um, for doing this. Uh, Epri did a lot of really strong work on, you know, 
computational domain for the entire year. It's a pretty broad distribution. You can see it sort of dissolves as it gets into that bay, but that's a good, strong, solid resource very close to your load. Um, speaking of the load, uh, this is, and granted, this is old. Actually, this has come down quite a bit because cost of energy has really driven a lot of families out and their population is dwindling. So they're, they have some base amount that they, did, they, have, they need to have for the school and for other things, but in reality, it's coming down. I think they're more in the 750 would be the higher end of their maybe, maybe one megawatt peak, um, you know, which is more what their nominal would be, so it's come down a bit. Um, but and this is, I found this to be a really interesting graph because I, I didn't look at this until after I'd been there. This was the cost of energy uh, that they were estimating the effort. And so this was done in like this time frame, 09, and they were saying it was going to go up, well, 4550. So basically, that much above is where we are today. That's pretty much that line straight on. They had, I mean, they, they were on that cadence from the get go. Um, and a lot of that is tied to fuel. Uh, of course, the fact that 100% uh, of their fuel is derived from uh, diesel generators, I mean, 100% of their electricity. So the, the one, you may, not be in, in, uh, you may not be aware of the one company that is sort of doing a lot of the work at, at, uh, at Yakta right now is, the, is Resolute Marine. Now, folks who are familiar with this, this is kind of similar to the Oyster, distant cousin uh, competitor on the East Coast. And they've actually uh, filed a permit, uh, oh, what was it, preliminary permit application that was approved earlier this year. And then uh, I'll put this here because it's out straight out of uh, uh, Bill's presentation. This is the schedule that he's putting out there. Um, it seems pretty aggressive to me for something of this magnitude. But uh, he is definitely there in, uh, they got the permit and they're doing the investigation right now in terms of environmental and siting. Mike, can I ask a question there? Absolutely. Is there, they have a site picked out, right? Well, their permit, is a land grab. Yeah, yeah, so the, the depths. Um, is that a similar place where you well uh, so your technology? These are in fathoms. They are much shallower than we are. This is what their permit stamps out. This is about the range of what's compatible with their technology. Um, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if they were just drawing a convenient box, they wanted to come out of the territorial sea, I don't know if they have something up their sleeve for an innovation that's going to go deeper, or if they're just trying to land and grab to, to hold off competitors. I don't know. Um, the reality is, you know, I've had some detailed discussions with uh, the Yakutat uh, folks and others, and you know, just kind of making sure that they are aware before you sign off all of this to one company, make sure you know what all technologies are out there. Sure. Um, so the, so the, the Alaska Territorial Sea Plan discusses how we, I mean, did they have to go through what we've gone through yet? What's the story there? It's, it's, I, I think this is all going to be new to them. That schedule is out of this world aggressive if you're yeah. not considering yeah. that whole process. Yeah, yeah. we're taping, so I'll withhold my personal comment on it. So <laughs> that, schedule, that schedule should, and if, they, if they don't have figured out how to permit, they probably have a lot longer time frame than Well, and, and, and so this presentation is online too. Um, and this is what he gave at the conference. There's a lot of DVDs around how you get it out there, how you moor it, how you anchor it, how you deal with um, the energetic environment. So there's a lot of DVDs that are pretty big DVDs. Um, maybe he's got something, you know, maybe they're doing some development work that I'm not aware of, but I, I would not put that schedule as something I would. And then here's what he's proposing for his interconnect, although I think I'd suggest for him next time when he makes a slide to erase the oyster part when he's borrowing stuff from Epi. Looks very familiar. Um, but let's talk, you know, so you, your question was around uh, our technology. So this, I know you probably are aware of this scene, but this, so this is the old version. Uh, this is the old bars that we used to, that we used to have as our main concept. Uh, we've actually kind of evolved a, a step beyond this. But this is a good surrogate to evaluate this because you don't need a lot of infra local infrastructure. You can tow this to site, submerge it, sits on the bottom, generates your power, You've got to figure out the power cable and what your technology is. So for our purposes, uh, you know, we would like to be 8 to 18 fathoms. That's about this red swath right here, right along in here. And so you know, Bill and Resolute, they're they're about two thirds of the way in from that because they're really in almost almost they don't quite break the surface like 
uh, Oyster does, but they're pretty close. Um, so you know, we kind of kind of concepted up what it would take to do a, a megawatt peak. Uh, you know, seven to ten devices on a, on a stable platform that you would tow out and submerge. Because obviously, there's not a lot of crane barges and things around. And, um, you know, the nice thing about this location is you would probably still build all this in Oregon, because by the time you built it in Seattle and then navigated it out through all the different channels and whatnot, you might as well build it here and bring it up there. And we're an Oregon company anyway, so we'd rather do that. Of course, that being said, I took a walk on uh, on Canada Beach, and you know, barges don't play nice really with the, with the, the Alaskan environment necessarily. Uh, this was a, a famous barge that washed up uh, or was eaten for breakfast at one point. It's a very energetic sea. It's um, it's a pretty rugged area. So, to give an example, the shore is littered with these trees. Um, that they're sawed up off and right immediately as soon as they land because people use them for heating because of the cost of energy. Um, but to give an example, that's about a three fathom diameter root ball, put into fisheries terms. So I would be very concerned, even at our, I mean, at our depths, we're just getting out of the range of where this is going to be, uh, will make it down to us, hopefully, unless it's standing on end or bouncing along. But certainly anything near shore, man, this would scare the heck out of me. Because uh, that's going to come, if you got some moving part like a flap or other thing. Um, and you know, the, and this is another picture. I didn't take this one. This was a different time of year, but you can see it's just there's a lot going on, a lot of churn, um, a lot of stuff being brought ashore uh, that's going to pass right through wherever you're generating electricity. And that the same is true if you're offshore and you are, uh, you know, and you're, you're you're moored. Those things are going to tangle up in the moorings if you're not, you know, if you're not doing something like a CPT single point mooring or other. Other, I don't, you might be able to get outside of this, I'm not sure. A lot of this is actually erosion from across the bay. There's a cliffside being eroded and it drags trees into the ocean, then churns up a bit and brings them back here. But there's also, you know, there was tsunami debris here. I found a, a light bulb intact that had, it was, had all kinds of Chinese writing on it. I'm um, going to clean it up and see if it'll actually light. The filament's intact too, it's pretty crazy. So, you know, that's kind of the, the background on Yak Attack and, you know, some of the challenges. You know, the question is really, what, what would a lower cost of electricity do for them? Um, and there's the obvious one, it's going to reduce the cost of living. I mean, that's, that's kind of a foregone conclusion. But, um, you know, and, and right now, most of their, their economy revolves around some commercial fisheries and some, um, and a lot of recreational fishing. So it's, a, it's also a world-class recreational fishing destination. Uh, tons of lodges, tons of fly-out charters from there on uh, the float planes and whatnot. But uh, if you had cheap electricity, you could expand, or preserve at least, and maybe even expand your commercial fisheries. So part of the problem we're having is you can have a fishing fleet that can go out to sea during the day and bring back a catch, but if it costs too much to freeze it, they're going to take it down to the next port. Or they're going to make their own ice on board if it's cheaper for them to do that than to buy ice from you. So if you're, if you're able to sell cheap ice, you're going to have fisheries that are going to be able to, 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 to use more of the local, local resources. Um, and if not, I mean, that's what's happening right now, is a lot of those, those that fishing fleet, whether it's based in the Yakutat or not, it bypasses Yakutat altogether. Um, even though they've got the air service and all the other means that they can bring stuff in and out, if they could have cold storage where they can store stuff until the monthly barge comes through, um, it would open up a lot of things. I'll, you know, the other thing I, I thought about is this: any energy-intensive activities, specifically like greenhouse type stuff. If you could start growing vegetables and things, I mean, at 13 bucks a head of lettuce, that's a that's a pretty big, uh, a pretty quick return on investment if you had cheap energy to be able to, or lower cost energy to be able to to make that uh, locally. Not only that, you can start exporting it to the other communities. Um, because there, you know, there are communities all up and down. You saw that that map, and they're all suffering the same fate in terms of paying for uh, time-sensitive things, particularly foodstuffs, uh, and maybe aquaculture. Might be some other opportunities. Uh, I know there's been some false starts on a lot of different things trying to grow there in terms of industries, and I think the, the cost of energy is a, a big killer to a lot of them. anything that takes requires that energy is uh, you can't can't surmount that. And there's probably a lot of other ideas. You know, I think. If, they, they don't know yet if you came in and said we've got something that'll bring your cost of energy back to where it was 15 years ago. You know what? Uh, you know what? Do you, what other things can we do? And uh, the 
What was I going to say? Um, you know, in terms of being able to get a project out there, this has been a lot of background. I haven't talked a lot about getting projects out there except for the one that's, that they're working on. And, um, you know, there's probably some opportunity from uh, the Alaska government side, from, uh, for, of course, the federal government, uh, tribal resources. So this is still about a 50-50 mix of uh, folks of tribal ancestry and folks of non-tribal. Um, and, and so there's probably some opportunity there. I think it's just going to be a question of who, who's going to be able to put together the right package that will, that will go through. It's hard in a lot of cases, particularly from a financial standpoint, to justify the, the return on investment of, a, of an installation that's going to cost you, you know, eight or ten million dollars for a hundred and whatever I said, sixty-five people or something. Um, but I think you know, there's broader aspects of that in terms of preserving the, the community and the heritage. You know, Alaska has a lot of interest in that and a lot of pride in that. Um, so there might be other non-financial motivations for investment there. I don't know how this is going to play out. Um, Renz has had an interesting uh, perspective. He thought we would be prototyping and pilot testing in Oregon. And then our first commercial arrays of wave energy in the northwest, the greater northwest, would be in Alaska in places like this. And I think you might be right. Um, they're certainly very motivated customers. Um, and our last picture is one I took when we were driving over the roads. Um, I said, I told them to pull, yell and pull over because I saw this big clump. That's about eight to ten feet tall, that clump. And sure enough, we start hiking a little closer to it and this head pops up, starts staring at us. Um, we didn't get too much closer though because it couldn't tell if he was sizing us up to see if we were liftable or not. <laughs> so, any questions? I, I would caution you of showing this to wildlife folks, because there's actually laws about how close you can get to the nests. We were pretty far. Okay. There was a stream. <laughs> I, this is my Zoom. Okay. <laughs> we would have gotten closer, but there's a stream in our way, and I did yeah, cross the stream. Yeah. Uh, Alaska's versions of streams are different than oh, our yeah. streams. Yeah. Well, and it's one of those things in Alaska, like I, my parents lived in Juneau for a while. It, it, they're like bro or crows, they're everywhere. So <laughs> other questions? Yeah. Probably offline. Well done. Thanks. Well we can go offline if you want to ask the real questions. I have a I have a quick question though. Are they a truly open port? Are are they are they seeing the full force of the Alaskan uh, the uh, Bay of Alaska, are they sheltered by um, islands, like most of that stretch? Well, um, so this is the Gulf of Alaska here. This okay. is the wave energy coming in. This is the port. Oh, okay. So they just buried that little outcrop of where you want to put yeah, the energy. Yeah, and you come right in here. And this is where the energy is, and so you can be able to direct line to the community right. and then the load. Uh, the thing that, you know, at first when they approached CPT and asked if they want to come to the like, why would we ever go up there? And they pointed out does, they, don't, they don't freeze over the ocean here, doesn't freeze over, ice over. So now all of a sudden floating devices, have, you know, you can, you can start to consider floating devices farther out. Um, it's still pretty energetic, it's still pretty aggressive, but that's the point. Right? So, so you don't see floating ice? I don't know if you see floating ice come through. It doesn't freeze over. That was yeah. it. From my standpoint, I... I don't, I don't pay attention to that as much, I think, as being three or four miles out, um, something close floating by, but uh, I've certainly never heard of big chunks of ice coming ashore. Uh, they get a lot of snow, but they're pretty warm, actually, there. They don't, they don't freeze that hard, they don't get that, that hot in the summer. It's actually fairly temperate. Uh, I was going to come back up to another one here. Beginning. Um, Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not really sure this kind of makes it look like it's an island, it's a peninsula, but, um, yeah, I mean, you recognize some of those are areas that definitely freeze over in the winter and are not places you'd want to try and put any surface device, even maybe bottom devices for that matter, like scour and things under the underside of, of ice, but, um, it's a fair question. It was something, it's something whoever goes in first should definitely be conscious of. I think it's, I think this is going to be a brutal deployment, I think. There's going to be some things chewed up and spat out, uh, no matter what technology it is. 
um, concerning the military presence? Is it completely inactive? Did they abandon the site? The, so the they Yacht sold it over, transferred it over. The Yacht 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 owns the owns the airport. I believe and so. Yakutat. Well, no, I think there's um, sort of port authority. Yeah, maybe. something like that. But the, the, there's a big hangar on the airport. I don't know if it was in that one picture or not. It sounds like that's private, actually. Some guy owns that and has like warbirds in it um, that he brings in from time to time. Because they do it, and there's a lot of uh, small, uh, air, small scale aerial stuff for fishing. I mean, while we were there, there was a Learjet. So some dudes wanted to go fishing, so they took their Learjet. I mean, it's such a big runway, you could bring in the Concorde or something, and it still exists. Um, up by the fuel, just to the lower, just to the right of the fuel, that is a big hangar, and it's classic World War II style hangar. It looks like it looks like it hasn't been painted since then, but um, that's under private ownership. The rest of the airport, I think, is uh, under the control of either Yak Attack or the community or some sort of Alaska small rural. Uh, it's kept running by subsidized by the the rural airports. Uh, act of whatever, you know, the thing that really subsidize these smaller scale airports to keep them going to preserve some of these communities' operational and viability. And I think they also, I, I don't know if this is explicit or just sort of under the, an undercurrent, but they, they kind of like the idea of somebody using it so it's sort of maintained so that if you ever needed to annex it again, you know, if you got the Cold War erupts again all of a sudden, this is a pretty strategic place to be. Sure. Um, yeah, I imagine the, the cost of maintaining that airport alone. Is are huge. Yeah, I know they're not born by the, the local community. Sure. Yeah. They may be managed by the local community, but they're not born by the local community. For sure. Yeah, it's a very strange dynamic in terms of the finances and the economics of the whole area. Um, and a lot of the legacy infrastructure from, from the past. It's just it's a bizarre combination of things. What's their uh, demand? Look like are they do they peak in the winter or do they peak in the summer? I mean, imagine heating has got to. But I would, I would also imagine that they don't do necessarily much electrical heating up there. Um, yeah. Or? So well, this is. Yeah, actually, this is a year. So you can see. Um, yeah, it looks like a summer. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of seems more like a summer. I think they do a lot of of uh, wood heating, a lot of. Um, Biomass type stuff. Um, you, know, you just saw harvesting off the off the beach. So I think a lot of their load, uh, at least in the winter, is probably around uh, the school, because that's not uh, that's not heated by wood, I believe. Um, but they do. They also do some fuel oil heating some places. I think, but that gets pretty expensive as well. Um, it's. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where you know, they, they this whole renewable energy conference they put on was hosted by the school district actually, and they were looking at biomass, they people from biomass, solar, which does actually kind of work up there, um, wind, which there's a lot of wind going up, small scale wind, you know, uh, ten kilowatts, they're smaller, uh, but there's always certain makes and models that survive. A lot of them they'll ice over. Uh, they'll get these. They'll get unstable wheat if they ice over, and one blade's heavier than the other, and they shred themselves. You know, there's some places, you know, where the peaks where they'll have 180 to 200 mile an hour winds recorded at different times of the year. Um, so it's it's kind of an unforgiving environment for just about anything mechanical. Otherwise, other yeah, questions. One one thing I would like to talk with you about, which I think is a good segue for it, is that when I look at this isolated community, I see pork me in a way. So the, the whole supply chain, that was the purpose of that trip to Scotland, yeah. to see what they're doing right, what they're not doing right, what we could do in our case, and in the case of Dakotat, um, what would that look like for them? So that's something that, that we could have a discussion about as we, yeah. as we uh, process all that learning. And by supply chain, do you mean in terms of fabrication or in terms of the operations and maintenance? I mean, everything, from what does it take to have an industry, especially in this case, you're looking at Probably mainly supporting that with local, at least for, for service and operations and maintenance. Yeah. It's too expensive to drag all that in from remotely, but to yeah. um, to think about what that supply chain or maybe value chain is a better word for that. What that yeah. would look like to support, say you were to have a commercial development there. What would it take to support your commercial development? So that's something that we're, we'll be working with with the, the team there and we'll need to 
to get a picture of what that would look like? I think one thing is definitely clear. If you've got any heavy infrastructure, I mean, heavy uh, vessels or other things, this is one of the few places that you're going to be able to either you know, pick up supplies or to do maintenance or you know, if you need the heavy vessels for operations and maintenance of weight energy devices or you just have a giant weight energy device that you need to bring somewhere to do some final preparation for operations, I, this is one of the few places that you can navigate into that is close to any kind of a, a, a harbor type infrastructure for sure. What do they have for lifting capability there at the port? Do they have cranes? There were a couple of cranes. I don't know if that was shown up in that one picture or not. Probably not. Um, you can't quite see it. There are a couple of very small cranes. We're talking, you know, tens of tons at the most. Okay. Uh, but they also have barges. I mean, they have, um, so you, you, know, you could definitely bring in crane barges, no problem. Uh, they have they have cruise ships stop in the past and distant past um, because it is so deep. Um, yeah, I don't know. That, I don't know if they have much now. It'd be one of those things like like Seen saying where you'd have to assess it, and you know, I mean, they're they're committed. They're definitely looking. I mean, frankly, they seem to be like they're on their verge of survival in terms of they're a, you know, a few more students away from losing critical mass at their school, so the school closes and then a bunch more people leave because they want to get an education elsewhere. Then it becomes hard to justify keeping the airport open. The next thing you know, they're back to a subsistence fishing village and maybe a playground for the guys with clear jets. But um, I think they would definitely like to see how they get, how they start growing instead of colla collapsing, contracting like that. You know, maybe it is you, you know, repurpose some of these abandoned. I think some of this is still in use, but some of it was abandoned. Um, but you know, you repurpose some of that to, for, you know, infrastructure and support for operations. Uh, they do have divers. They have people who are certified uh, dry suit divers um, for different activities. Um, so, I mean, they do have some capabilities, and they have the fishing fleet and things that you need to support that, but it's, it's a lighter, it's a lighter weight, lighter touch version of what I think they could or would like to have. Other questions? Okay, thanks. <laughs>